Welcome back to Coursera and Lecture 7. We're going to continue our conversation now about the distribution of the nerves that arise from the brachial plexus and play key roles in the innervation of specific muscles, skin, and joints that make up the upper limb. We talked in our last hour about the regions of muscles in the arm, the forearm, or the hand that are getting segmental innervation via the big five nerves that are coming out of the brachial plexus. Equally important, however, particularly with regard to their clinical anatomy, is their cutaneous distribution. So let's revisit them. Looking first at the musculocutaneous nerve, one of the reasons this nerve gets its name is because it innervates the three muscles that we previously located in the anterior aspect of the arm, but then the musculocutaneous nerve becomes cutaneous and innervates skin as shown by the area in green on the lateral aspect of the forearm. So you might expect if one had a lesion and injury of the musculocutaneous nerve, if it's a dramatic effect, it would affect or weaken anterior arm muscles and cause altered sensation, numbness, tingling, or pain, or even a loss of sensation on the lateral aspect of the forearm. Then let's look at the median nerve. Very important because the median ulnar and radial nerves innervate skin of the hand. Look at the distribution of the cutaneous branches of the median nerve. We say that the median nerve innervates the skin of the lateral half of the palm, including skin covering the thenar eminence as well as our lifeline, but also skin of the thumb, the index, the middle, and half of the ring finger on their palmar sides. But note that even though the median nerve contains anterior division fibers, it also innervates the nail beds of those same four digits. The nail bed of the thumb, the index, the middle, and the ring finger. Then let's compare that with the distribution cutaneous-wise of the ulnar nerve. The ulnar nerve basically innervates skin of the medial side of the palm, including skin covering the thenar, hypothenar eminence, and skin of the entire surface of the pinky and the entire medial surface of the ring finger and their corresponding nail beds. So as a corollary, note the course taken by the ulnar nerve as it passes from the arm into the forearm. It passes in close proximity to a bony prominence on the medial aspect of the humerus known as the medial epicondyle. This position puts that nerve in a, in a kind of a precarious location such that when you bang your elbow on its medial side, you are likely to get numbness, tingling, and maybe even pain in the cutaneous territory served by the ulnar nerve because the ulnar nerve basically in the lay population is known as the funny bone because when you bang on it in its subcutaneous position as it crosses adjacent to the medial epicondyle, you get numbness or tingling basically in the skin served by the median nerve on the medial side of the palm of the hand and the medial one and a half digits. Then, we don't have the distribution here, but I can outline it for you through the beauty of the smart board. The axillary nerve has a very has a relatively small cutaneous distribution. It's only innervating a small patch of skin that's largely over the attachment of the deltoid to approximately the middle of the humeral shaft. Then the radial nerve, on the other hand, has a more extensive cutaneous distribution, giving rise to a posterior cutaneous nerve of the arm that innervates skin on the posterior aspect of the arm as well as providing cutaneous innervation to much of the posterior aspect of the forearm. Note also, even though it's not shown here, we can see it's the nerve that's serving it, but not its actual distribution. You're looking here at the cutaneous branch of the radial nerve, its superficial branch. It is innervating skin on the dorsal side of the lateral 
three and one half digits and the corresponding skin associated with the dorsum of the hand. So this is the cutaneous area, coloring notwithstanding, of the radial nerve. And we kind of describe this as innervating skin that's positioned over this web space between the thumb and the index finger. But it's also in a position to innervate skin, so I can erase it a little bit, covering the anatomic snuff box, which was that interesting little anatomic area found between two of the extensor tendons of the thumb. So even though the radial nerve doesn't innervate any intrinsic hand muscles, it's in, a it's in a position to innervate some of the skin on the dorsum of the hand, including the dorsal aspects of thumb, index, middle, and half of the ring finger. Now then, let's look at some details regarding upper limb blood supply. We've talked in conceptual terms about it. Now let's identify the specific players. <clears throat> and the point that we want to make, as before, is that the principal source of arterial blood supply to the proximal part of the upper limb is provided by the same tube that changes its name three times. It begins as the subclavian artery. That is basically going to be the principal source of arterial blood supply to the entire upper limb. It is arising in the root of the neck differentially on each side, but nevertheless a subclavian. The subclavian artery will give rise to some small branches that supply muscles and skin on the posterior aspect of the, of the shoulder. But fundamentally, the bottom line is, I don't know who made up this rule, but I'm just the messenger. The subclavian artery changes its name as it crosses the lower border or the lateral margin of the first rib. <clears throat> and once it changes its name, it now becomes the axillary artery. The axillary artery, as the name implies, runs through the armpit or the axilla, where it is intermingled with, as we saw, the branching pattern of the brachial plexus. But at the lower border of the teres major tendon, again, somebody decided that the axillary artery should change its name. Maybe they're having a slow news day. And they named it now the brachial artery. OK, I get it. It's logical. It's serving and coursing in the arm. But why can't we just call it the arm artery and be done with it? Well, I don't have that kind of influence. I'm just the messenger. So here basically is a another view of the name changes shown in color coordinated fashion of the three components of the single tube that provides much of the arterial blood supply to the proximal part of the upper limb. You can see first the area in blue is marked by the course taken by the subclavian artery until it reaches the lower border or the lateral margin of the first rib where it changes to the axillary artery. Axillary artery runs through the axilla, part of it coursing deep to a pectoralis major muscle before it passes the inferior margin of the teres major tendon where it changes its name again to the brachial artery. And what you're seeing here are a series of branches that are rising from subclavian, axillary, and brachial whose job it will be to supply the muscular walls and skin covering the walls of the axilla and also giving rise to a deep brachial artery that will sweep around the shaft of the humerus and supply mainly the triceps muscle on the posterior aspect of the arm. The other significant thing that we'll point out with regard to this is in many cases arteries don't run to their ultimate source or their site of termination all by themselves. So make note of this because we can see two significant branches of this arterial blood supply, the posterior circumflex humeral artery and the deep brachial artery. Note that they appear to be running in isolation around the humerus, but they're not running alone. Note that the posterior circumflex humeral artery is coursing around the proximal part of the humerus with the axillary nerve. And the deep brachial artery is spiraling around the humerus with the radial nerve. 
So you'll hear a little later in our conversation during this lecture series about various humeral fractures. Two of them might occur, one of them might occur in the proximal part of the humerus near its so-called surgical neck. Another humeral fracture <clears throat> tends to occur at the midpoint of the humerus and each of those fractures is likely to lacerate or injure an artery, posterior circumflex humeral and or axillary nerve, or the radial nerve along with the deep brachial artery. Note that a synonym for the word deep in anatomy is profunda. So sometimes atlases will refer to the deep brachial artery correctly as the profunda brachial artery. All right, then we've already seen this picture, but let's extend it a little more because we know that the brachial artery, there it is, after it courses through the length of the arm, will bifurcate, split, just distal to the cubital fossa into two tubes of, a bro of approximately the same diameter. And they will be the radial artery that runs on the superficial aspect of the radius and the ulnar artery that's running in close proximity to the ulna, hence the name. And we've already indicated the significance of the ability to compress the distal part of the radial artery against the anterior part of the radius, providing a mechanism to detect a peripheral pulse rate. Then the additional feature about blood supply of these two arteries, radial and ulnar, is that they actually join together with one another <clears throat> either potentially or, or actually, and what they do is, here for example is the ulnar artery, it gives rise to an arch-like structure called the superficial palmar arch. And the superficial palmar arch actually has a connection to the radial artery, whereas the radial artery over here gives rise to something called the deep palmar arch, which has a connection with the ulnar artery arising from those, this pair of arches, are digital branches that provide what we would call a very adequate blood supply, primary and secondary, to the hand and fingers. So in essence, most tissues in the body have a primary source of arterial blood supply and a potential backup blood supply. Here, this is particularly evident by illustrating the fact that there are two arch-like arteries fed by arterial blood from the radial and the ulnar artery, respectively, providing blood supply to the hand and fingers. What this means is, if there were a slowly developing blockage, let's say, of the ulnar artery, the radial artery could continue to perfuse the areas normally supplied by the ulnar artery as a source of collateral or backup circulation. <clears throat> then if we extend this by looking at the arrangement of these arteries in an arteriogram, we obviously have a more realistic view. And again, you can see the course taken by the radial artery, sweeping up on the thumb or radial side of the forearm and then hand and it's sweeping across and forming a potential anastomosis with the ulnar artery. And we can see the ulnar artery giving rise to a more superficial palmar arch that sweeps out and again seems to have a connection with the radial artery. So again, these two palmar arches are again capable of providing or giving rise to various branches off of both of them that supply the hand, fingers, and thumb. And then lastly, an additional significance of the anatomic snuff box. Again, we identified it earlier, and you should do so as well by extending your thumb and making its two extensor tendons stand out. And the shallow depression between those extensor tendons is the anatomic snuff box, where snuff was placed there, presumably, as we said, in medieval times. But the other point about the snuff box is that it is traversed by the radial artery. So after the radial artery crosses the anterior aspect of the radius, it passes on the dorsal side of the wrist by passing deep to the two tendons that make up the anatomic snuff box on its way to diving down deeply 
between the fleshy space muscles that are found between the thumb and the index finger on its way to helping to supply the thumb and the index finger. So that's the point that we make here, that another significant feature of this quirk of anatomy, the anatomic snuff box, is the radial artery is running through the floor of it. And you can also see here the cutaneous branch, one of the major ones, of the radial nerve, the superficial branch of the radial nerve, innervating skin covering the anatomic snuff box, as we previously described. Then, venous drainage. We've made a comment earlier about the significance for phlebotomy, basically, of the median cubital vein. But now let's put the venous drainage into a little bit of perspective. Note, first off, that there are two superficial veins that drain skin and tissue that's situated, obviously, in an area topographically on the surface of the upper limb. And these two veins are a basilic vein and a cephalic vein. The cephalic vein largely arises mainly from a dorsal venous network that most individuals can see standing out on the dorsal aspect of their hand. Then some of the tributaries of that venous network head into the basilic vein as well. Then the cephalic vein largely drains up the upper limb on the lateral aspect of the forearm and arm before, before crossing a interval between the deltoid muscle and the pectoralis major and then ultimately draining into the axillary vein. Whereas the basilic vein drains more with its tributaries on the medial aspect of the forearm, medial aspect of the arm, basically before draining down into a deeper position. So not only do we have a pair of superficial veins that are draining in isolation, we also have deeply placed veins that are running with the arteries of the same name. So running along with the radial artery and the ulnar artery and the brachial artery will be veins of the same name that are draining more deeply placed structures. Now let's look briefly at our digital anatomy atlas to give us again a more three-dimensional approach to the particularly the vasculature of the upper limb. Here in this dissected view of the axilla we see the red tube which is the single arterial tube that's changing its name three times and if we kind of rotate around here, we can see how it's running parallel to basically a vein that also has the same three name change components. So if we kind of highlight the components of the artery, we can point out, first off, there's the subclavian artery found basically in the root of the neck proximal to the first rib. Once it passes the lower border of the first rib, it changes its name and becomes the axillary. We'll roll this around like this. There we go. And then finally, below the teres major tendon, it becomes the brachial artery, and you see it there superimposed behind a vein of the same name. Then we also see the terminal course of the two superficial veins that we just alluded to. Here basically is the termination of the cephalic vein. It's draining into the axillary vein, as you see there. And then situated a little more distantly, we see the pair the basilic vein that's draining into the brachial vein or joining to help form it just on the medial side of the brachial artery. And then the two significant branch of the arterial blood supply they il illustrated just because they course with nerves that are important. There's the posterior circumflex humeral artery sweeping around the surgical neck of the humerus with the axillary nerve. And down there there is the radi there is the deep brachial artery sweeping around the posterior aspect of the humerus with the radial nerve. When I swing all the way around here, you can see the course taken by that deep brachial artery as well as the course taken by the posterior circumflex humeral artery as it sweeps around the surgical neck of the humerus, deep brachial artery running with the radial nerve.